The Night Beat starts right now. Tonight, a local school board meeting turned into a call for action. It's all after the death of a man known as Mr. Fred, former and current special education teachers from the Northside Independent School District, frustrated over the loss of 73 year old Alfred Jimenez, who died after he was hurt while working in a classroom. So right now it's unclear exactly what caused Mr. Fred's death, but his colleagues say that what happened to him proves that teachers need help. The night team's John Paul Baraja shows us how the meeting went. When was the last time any of you were hit by a student? A regularly scheduled Northside Independent School District school board meeting. And there would be hitting, chasing around the room, spitting, punching, kicking. Was filled with special education teachers. Students should have a right to be safe. Shouldn't staff also all detailing their experiences in classrooms with students with severe learning and emotional disabilities. I had to go out and buy myself gloves to keep my hands from being scarred anymore. I had to go out and buy a face shield to keep my face from being scratched. Special education teacher Alana Taylor said this is what her face looked like after a student scratched her. This is ridiculous. That that story on the news with Fred could have been me. Those who spoke said the death of NISD instructional assistant Alfred Jimenez, better known as Mr. Fred, should have never happened. Although it's unclear exactly what happened, NISD officials say Mr. Fred sustained a head injury while trying to, quote, redirect a special needs student. The blame does not lie on the students. The blame does not lie on the teachers. The blame lies in the lack of funding and the lack of resources that our schools continue to have, and that we look to the state of Texas for that. Melina Espiritu Osocad, president of Northside AF a union that represents NISD teachers and staff says on top of additional state funding, members want more training for staff and more staff in classrooms. I was so close to quitting numerous times this year. You need to reevaluate the number of teachers to staff ratios in special education. Per school board protocol, board members did not directly address what you heard these teachers talk about tonight, but they did say they're listening. John Paul Barajas, KSAT. 12 news. That's all we have signed. How a former Judson ISD band director could spend the rest of his life in prison for child porn. Mark Mallow was convicted of possessing and promoting child pornography. Police arrested him in August of 2022, and that was while he was teaching at Woodlake Hills Middle School. The social media app Snapchat noticed his explicit media and then reported it. While he was out on bond, police arrested him again on three other charges, including online solicitation of a minor, and he's going to be tried for that at a later date. Hundreds of thousands of acres burned, developing right now across the Texas panhandle. Crews battling several massive wildfires as we speak. That's the smoke you see behind me. Tonight, evacuation orders in place for those who live north of Amarillo, and within the last couple of hours, flames have spread into southern Oklahoma. That's according to the Texas A&M Forest Service. The largest of the infernos, the Smokehouse Creek Fire. It is 0% contained tonight. Right now, there are no reports of any injuries. It's still not clear what sparked the flames. Strong winds, though, have made the job even more difficult for firefighters. Yes, yeah, Steve, talk about strong winds. Non-thunderstorm wind gusts over 60 miles per hour today from Lubbock to Amarillo, even up into Guymon, Oklahoma. 62 mile per hour peak gusts in Amarillo, up to 68 miles per hour for peak gusts in Guymon, Oklahoma. That combined with very dry air, we're talking relative humidity down to about 13% at times earlier today, making it almost impossible to fight these serious fires that we have ongoing in the Texas Panhandle now stretching into parts of Oklahoma. The most recent wind gusts, not as high, but still up there. 54 miles per hour gust most recently in Amarillo, 45 which miles per hour in Wichita Falls. You see that convergence zone here of the streamlined winds. That's the cold front that's headed our way. That cold front will give us some higher winds tomorrow, but nothing like what you see up in West Texas and in the Panhandle. By 6 a.m., that's when the cold front arrives. At that point, winds are going to pick up and gust between 40 and 45 miles per hour. We'll be dealing with that for most of the day tomorrow. Those are the gusts. The steady sustained winds will be 20 to 25 miles per hour with very dry air. Also a bit of a temperature swing coming our way. Have your jacket ready. We'll talk in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. We are exactly one week away from the Texas primaries and Friday. The last day for early voting. Here's the thing, though. Some people are still waiting for their mail-in ballots to arrive. And if that's you, the night team's Patty Santos tells you what you can do.
I always do it because I have a bad knee and and I, I want to know when the mail ballot comes in so that I'll, I'll know, I have the information for the other seniors. Lydia Martinez was left waiting for her mail-in ballot. She applied for it three weeks ago and never got it. She's worried she's not alone. How many other people have not received their mail ballot? When she asked the elections office what happened, they told her they never got the application. There have uh, been a number of folks who have uh, not gotten mail ballots, and it's getting very late. We sat down with Precinct 4 Bear County Commissioner Tommy Calvert. He had just left a meeting with the Texas Civil Rights Project investigating similar complaints about mail-in ballots. What I would encourage people to do is lodge their complaint with the 1-866-R-VOTE hotline and let the lawyers begin to investigate uh, the systemic issues that are going on. Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan told KSET she was not aware of mail-in ballots not arriving. Callanan explained a wave of applications came in at the beginning of February. They were all processed over the weekend. She says her office mailed out 19,000 ballots, but only 6,000 have come back so far. If you're still waiting for your mail-in ballot, there's time. You have until Friday to vote early. Keep in mind that handicap accessible curbside voting is available at precincts. And if you get the ballot mailed to you in the last minute, you can drop it off directly at the elections office at South Frio and I-10. If you mail it, it has to be postmarked by election night, which is March 5th. Encourage people to do everything they can and not let anyone turn them away from voting. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. While we talk about voting, looking ahead, President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump are both expected at the border this Thursday. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg is also going to be there, but Mayor Nuremberg is specifically going to be meeting with President Biden in Brownsville to discuss the influx of migrants at the Texas-Mexico border. Now, meanwhile, former President Trump is going to be in Eagle Pass. We're going to have crews on the border this Thursday covering both President Biden's and former President Trump's visit. And staying with the mayor, Ron Nuremberg joined us today ahead of his trip to Brownsville during our KSAT Q&A segment on the News at 6. We asked him about the border, but we also wanted to ask him about the future of the silver in black in San Antonio. Here's what he had to say about the buzz behind the current location of the Institute of Texan Cultures, or the ITC, in a potential new downtown arena for the Spurs. A central part of that is the ITC property, and, and so uh, we have been engaged uh, in, in following that process, and, and uh, we believe that it could be a, a, an important part of moving forward. While discussing the larger vision of sports and entertainment in the Alamo City, the mayor also mentioned he'd like to see San Antonio host the college football playoffs in the future, among other things. You can watch our full interview right now on KSAT+. Plus. And now let's go to your night beat news flash. Top congressional leaders were in the White House this afternoon as the clock keeps ticking on a partial government shutdown this weekend. House leaders Mike Johnson and Hakeem Jeffries joined Senators Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell in the Oval Office for what they're calling an intense meeting with the president and vice president. We're told that helping Ukraine, that was the main topic during the meeting. After the meeting, the House Speaker said that one of his priorities was securing the border, but he also told reporters that there would be a deal on this. In Georgia, a former law partner of Fulton County Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade told the court what he knew about a romantic relationship between Wade and District Attorney Fonnie Willis. That romance has been in the spotlight in the Fulton County 2020 election interference case against former President Donald Trump, whose team argues that Willis benefited financially by hiring Wade, in part because the pair went on multiple trips together. Now, Terrence Bradley ultimately told the courtroom that he didn't recall the relationship starting or even when it started. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. If for the first time in five months, someone in Bear County has died from coronavirus. Bear County releasing their newest COVID data report just a few hours ago. Almost 900 new cases to report. That's down significantly from the 1,200 new cases reported for the week prior. However, that one death brings the total COVID deaths in Bear County up to 6,262 since the county started keeping track of COVID data back in March of 2020. 
Okay, check your medicine cabinets. The Food and Drug Administration is recalling several brands of eye drops. Brassica Pharma Far Private Limited, Equate Lubricant Eye Ointment, and the CVS Health Lubricant Eye Ointments, all of those are being recalled. Consumers are being advised to take the ointments back to the place where they bought them to get, to get their money back. And you can read more on the FDA's website. More than $20,000 spent on tickets for a UTSA football suite, snacks, liquor. We have the receipts showing the Brooks Development Authority paid for it all. Still, the government entity stands by the purchase, why a public policy expert calls the spending questionable. Thousands of dollars spent on food, drinks, and fun. Records obtained by KSAT show that's what the Brooks Development Authority, also known as Brooks, did this fall. Now, a public policy expert tells our Daniela Ibarra that it's a concerning use of public dollars. Under the bright lights of the Alamo Dome, UTSA's football team secured some major wins. Every touchdown, followed by the roar of Roadrunner fans. Some of them lucky enough to catch the action from this suite, which records show the Brooks Development Authority paid $18,540 for. So we exist ultimately to attract businesses, to attract quality jobs to Brooks, but more importantly to San Antonio. Records show Chief Strategy Officer Connie Gonzalez signed off on the suite in September of 2023 which includes 16 tickets. Who was using the suite? So um, the, the priority uh, was not necessarily the usage, then the priority was to make sure that we're supporting um, UTSA. Um, however, uh, we were able to invite um, various partners, uh, various staff members, various board members. So. Have you guys used it to try to get businesses to come here? So our, our priority and our, our reasoning behind it, again, first and foremost, was to support UTSA um, athletics. The Brooks Development Authority is a government entity that oversees Brooks on the south side. It's governed by a board of directors appointed by the San Antonio City Council. However, we are not supported um, by taxpayer funds. And so all of our operations uh, is completely funded by our uh, leases and our sales that we conduct on campus. James Quintero, a policy director with the Texas Public Policy Foundation, says it's still public money. And because it's public money, Brooks Development Authority has a responsibility to treat those dollars in a judicious way. And clearly spending it on games and booze is not really in service of any public purpose. Receipts show the Development Authority covered the bill for their game time snacks and alcohol. KSAT looked at Brooks' receipts from three UTSA home games, all exceeding $1,600. The tab for beer and liquor totaled $483 at one game, $468 at the next, to $584. Their expenses, the entity claims, helps the university. How has that helped? Sure. So I'll go back to um, the, the reason and the priority, and that goes back to supporting education, supporting our workforce, and supporting ultimately UTSA. UTSA matters to San Antonio, so UTSA matters to Brooks. But how does buying hundreds of dollars worth of alcohol help UTSA? Well, at Brooks, we're not only focused on attracting businesses, we're also focused on retaining. And um, part of that is showing off what San Antonio has to offer. Gonzalez says 2023 is the first year they paid for a suite and says it's up to the board to approve another. Do you think that this is a good use of money? Supporting UTSA and supporting our educational institution is always a good use of our money. How is the public made better by their expenditure of funds on games and alcohol. Um, I, I don't really think you can make an argument that the public is any better off for it. Danielle Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. Okay, now we're going to take a live look outside and look at that temperature right there. 74 degrees. We've been enjoying some nice t-shirt weather, but ooh, that's a changing. It's all changing first thing in the morning tomorrow, turning much cooler and windy. And then Thursday is going to be downright winter like and chilly. Let's get right to it. Starting with our afternoon high temperature trend we will be in the 60s tomorrow afternoon, but it's going to be a bit of a bumpy ride to get there. We'll get to that in a moment. Notice Thursday, the warmest we'll get is 52 degrees. So most of Thursday will be spent in the 40s, 
to lower 50s. Then we quickly rebound by Friday back into the 70s and Saturday it's 80 degrees and that cool down was just a distant memory. Our temperatures right now still in the 70s. Cold front though, it's moved into North Texas. Lubbock now 55 degrees, Amarillo 34. Amarillo dropped 21 degrees in under a half hour earlier today when that cold front hit. Here's a look at that front pushing southward about to hit Abilene next and behind the cold front temperatures as low as the single digits and even a little below zero as you get up into the Dakotas, Montana and Wyoming. So a real deal winter cold front is pushing southward, but we are not expecting freezing temperatures around here. It's going to be cooler though, and you'll want to have a jacket ready. We're going from the 80s the past couple of days, including today down into the 60s tomorrow. But notice at sunrise we will be in the 60s only to drop by 9 and 10 a.m. into the mid 50s and then gradually see that rebound into the mid 60s by tomorrow afternoon. Fair amount of cloud cover tomorrow. I'm not expecting really anything in terms of rain. If we see a stray sprinkle, that would pretty much be it. And uh, that would be the exception. It's going to be windy though. We talked about that earlier. North wind at 20 to 25 with gusts between 40 to 45. We made it into the 80s today. 84 was our high temperature. Another 80 degree day. It felt very spring like out there, but that's going to be changing. Here's the big picture. We've got the cold front off to the north, some snow behind that front. The big blue H that has been in charge of our weather is now moving its way farther to the south and east, and it's being replaced by the dip in the upper level flow. And this little swirl right here moving into Southern California and the desert southwest. Cold front hits in the morning, and then by Thursday, this disturbance throws some energy overhead our way and could kickstart a few light showers. I mean, we're talking mainly sprinkles on Thursday and even some patchy drizzle late in the day, but the overall precipitation and rainfall potential, the whole midsection of the country missing out over the next seven days. It's all west of the front range of the Rockies and then along and east of the Mississippi around here, some little light sprinkles and that's about it. And then a slight chance of a few isolated thunderstorms by Sunday and into Monday. So you look at these odds, a 20% chance Thursday, and that would be a hundredth of an inch or a few hundredths of an inch. By Sunday, 20% chance of some afternoon storms, Monday's 30% chance of late day showers and thunderstorms. We still have the humidity in place. Dew points in the 60s, part of that spring-like feel, that's going to be swept away and changed. Right when that cold front hits, 6 a.m. You'll notice that humidity drop very dry air Wednesday and Thursday and even to start the weekend. But notice by Sunday and into Monday, we get back into that muggy feeling and that will help with some of our storm chances by Sunday and Monday still on the low end. But of course, that could change between now and then. But some thunderstorms are possible at that point. Morning temperatures take a hit. We're down in the 40s Thursday and Friday morning before we rebound. Countdown's on 41 days to the total solar eclipse. An estimated 31.5 million people can see the total eclipse. The countdown for that continues, but we already know what happened on the road. Well, the, this is not, I mean, just the second half of the season not going the way the Spurs wanted it to. Not at all, but um, the road trip is hard. I mean, a whole month away from your home base, that is a tough ask for a young NBA team especially. And yes, unfortunately, it ends on a bad note for the Spurs. Sorry, some video trouble. We'll move on. A heated playoff battle also coming up between O'Connor and Harlan. The highlights coming your way after the break. We know we're the best team. We know that we're the number one ranked team. Like we know we, we have been preparing for this moment this whole season. The St. Mary's Hall girls basketball team is back in the final four of the TAPS 5A state tournament. And this time they're set out to win it all in big board sports.
The San Antonio Spurs paid a visit to the Western Conference leading Timberwolves this evening, looking to close out the rodeo road trip on a high note. First quarter, Victor Wembanyama takes Kyle Anderson off the dribble, and the French rookie drills a step back three pointer in the former Spurs face. Then a former number one overall pick himself, Anthony Edwards, with the acrobatic move for the one handed reverse layup. Second quarter, fellow French big Rudy Gobert throws it down with one hand over Wemby. Spurs trailed 58-43 at the half. Second half now, Devin Vassell uses the dribble handoff from Wembenyama and nails the baseline jumper. Wolves in control of this ball game though, making sure what happened in late January here in the Alamo City doesn't happen again. That's Ant with a transition dunk. Later, Minnesota native Trey Jones fires a cross court pass to Keldon Johnson. Johnson drains a three to make it interesting, but Monte Morris would make free throws to ice the game for Minnesota. Here is your final 114 105 Minnesota Vassell led the Spurs in scoring, as did Ant for the T Wolves. And both Defensive Player of the Year favorites led their teams in rebounding. After the game, head coach Greg Popovich kept it simple, blaming points off turnovers for the loss. Well, you, you, you can't win games when you give up 30 points off turnovers. That's the bottom line. And every time we've done that this year, we've gotten our butts kicked. So that happened again tonight. You know, everything else is pretty irrelevant. Last game, we gave up 34 points off turnovers. So that's the deal. This evening on the hardwood inside of the North Side Sports Gym, the O'Connor boys basketball team and Harlan Hawks collide in the Class 6A regional quarterfinals. Two teams that like to run a fast-paced offense. First quarter, O'Connor 6'6 senior Julian Barron posts up and floats in the first bucket of the game. Moments later, Braylon McMillan with a kick, quick pass to Barron in the paint for a wide open deuce. The winner here will face East Central in the Region 4 semifinals. Final minute of the opening quarter, Junior Evan Herrera makes the most of it with nothing but net from deep. Harlan is fast and athletic. The Hawks answer back with Elijah Moore, a triple from the wing. But it's O'Connor who comes out victorious in this one, advancing with the 66 to 52 final. After the break, the St. Mary's Hall girls basketball team's playoff preview. The St. Mary's Hall girls basketball team is back in the TAPS 5A state tournament. But this year, they're not content with just making it to the big stage. The Barons are chasing a state championship. Look at them this afternoon practicing against boys in preparation for a state semifinal rematch against Houston Second Baptist this afternoon, or sorry, this Thursday at noon at University High in Waco. There was a lot of pressure this year. Once you make it the first time, everyone pats you on the back, you know, but then there's that added level to, you know, get back and, and hopefully try to finish the job. Now, like, we know what we're supposed to do. We prepared, we planned, we prepped a lot. So I feel like we're here to make a statement this year. And unlike last year, the squad boasts experience as the Barons only graduated one senior from last year's historic run. I think as a team we've learned not to get frustrated with ourselves and to stay calm, which kind of go hand in hand. Uh, knowing that they're going to go on their runs and we're going to go on our runs and we just have to limit their runs is something that we've kind of lived off of the past few games. We know how to lock teams up on defense. All this whole season our strategy is just defense. So as long as we stay like disciplined defensively, I think we'll be okay. We know we're the best team. We know that we're the number one ranked team. Like We know we, we have been preparing for this moment this whole season. Second Baptist is a tough team to play, but I think they're ready to go. It sounds like it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be right back. Not only has it felt like spring three days in a row in the 80s and some humidity, but it's looking like spring. The mountain laurels are starting to pop out there mm. and you may notice that nice odor of Grape Kool-Aid in the air. Oh, yeah. Have them around you. That's, a, that's not just another sign of spring. It's a scent of spring. Now, you look at our pollen count. Ash is high, mulberry moderate, elm, hackberry, oak, all registering, but on the low end, a laundry list of spring allergens. And keep in mind, oak season typically peaks in early April. It really starts to ramp up late February and into early March. So get ready for your car to look like a tint of green 
Yeah, soon. I'm ready to get the Kool-Aid patch and get a Kool-Aid mustache going. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, Adam. Good night.